Let's get it. Let's get it. Happy Sunday. Or whatever day this is, if you're watching this on replay. Let me get my comment pinned. Uh, IG still has this, this change format up here. I don't know why. Periscope was good. Shout the cells out in the comment. Uh, is it comments? Yeah, it's comments on Periscope. Shout the cells out. Facebook, you can leave a comment anytime. This kind of lives on the Facebook page. Facebook got the longest tail for these. Periscope as well. Periscope's not bad. IG, as y'all are checking in, you can shout yourselves out in the comments section right now. We got Musty checking in from Toronto, Canada. As y'all are checking in, again, shout yourselves out in the comments section. We're going to get into it. Facebook, you, sh you coming in, shout yourselves out in the comments section right there. I'll give you a shout out if I see it while I'm talking here as I do my introduction. Periscope, as y'all checking in, you can shout yourselves out. I don't know, Periscope, I get a lot of replay views on Periscope. Facebook as well, but IG, most of those IG is going to be live. You're going to be in here. So as y'all checking in, again, shout yourselves out. We got New Jersey in the house, Mr. Compensation. I like that name, Mr. Compensation. As y'all checking in, shout yourselves out in the comment section. I'm going to give everybody like 10 more seconds, and we're going to get right into the material we need to get into here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. The sun is just now peeking over the edge of the, of the building, so I'm going to have the sun all in my face in a minute as we get in here. We got a live checking in from South Beach, took a vacation from the gutter. That's what's good. New Jersey just, just left Florida. All right, so everybody's checking in to Florida. It's a Florida is a beautiful place. And then in the fall, in the winter, Florida is a very popular place. People come here to get away, from the, get away from the snow. So that's what's up. Shout out to everybody who's going to Florida, visiting Florida, staying in Florida, leaving Florida. It's beautiful here. So that's a good decision. Shout out to y'all with that good decision. And shout out to everybody who's made the great decision to be here on this live. For those of you who don't know me, we got Slobo, Slobo checking in over on Facebook as well. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name, Slobo, but I, I know that first name. I have teammates with that name. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day. Former nine-year professional athlete, author of 27 books, including Work On Your Game and including The Mirror of Motivation. And I... Created this whole philosophy, this whole brand, this whole framework that is called work on your game. And what it's about is taking your taking the mental tools that you need to be a professional athlete. And that's getting to the top one percent of that profession and teaching how those same tools can be applied in everyday life. And of course, how they can be applied at work, how you can apply them in business, how you can apply them at your job, how you can apply them to anything that you want to do in life. That's what this whole philosophy, this whole brand, this whole framework is about. We got uh, Mary Rose checking in from Boston as well. Shout out to Boston. And what we're going to talk about here today in Periscope is y'all checking in. Shout yourselves out in the comment section. Facebook, y'all too. What we're talking about here today is why you should sweat the small stuff. Now, I know there was a book written. I forget who the author was. Anybody knows, you can tell me in the comment section. It says, do not sweat the small stuff or don't sweat the small stuff because it's all small stuff. And I'm not going against the premise of that book. I'm just I'm using that wording because we're going to talk about something that's a little bit different from that. Mark checking in on Periscope is good. Is that book was all about, you know, not making a mountain out of a molehill. Some little thing happens in life. Don't let that small thing throw you off or take you out of your game or bother you. And that's a great idea. Those things are right. But there are some small things in life, some tiny thing, things that might look microscopic in the big picture of life that do matter a whole lot. And that's the stuff that I'm talking about. You should sweat and you should pay attention for what you're doing out here. Because while we all understand that the big picture surely matters, it's the small details themselves that make the big picture a big picture, right? A big picture is this a met is this a an amalgamation of a whole bunch of small pictures all put together. Any of you ever put together like a big jigsaw puzzle? What is it? It's a whole bunch of small pieces. You just figure out where each piece goes and you put them all together. Then eventually you got this big finished, you got this big finished you know, masterpiece type thing. Somebody said Jordan sweated the small stuff. Yes. Anybody who becomes great at what they do, they understand the big picture. And they know when and how to sweat the small stuff. So it's not every small thing that you need to sweat. There are certain small things that you need to sweat. Just like in life, when we talk about hard work, my whole brand is called work on your game. So do I believe in working hard? Of course. But it doesn't mean you should work hard at everything. You need to pick the things that are most important for you to work hard on. So today what we're talking about are what those small things are, what you should pay the most attention to. Because since... Most people who are listening to this have never been bitten by an elephant. An elephant's a pretty big animal. Everybody here has been bitten by a mosquito. And a mosquito is a little tiny thing 
that is like, it would take how many mosquitoes to make up the size of your body? Probably a couple hundred thousand million mosquitoes, but you've been bitten by one and you know the bite from a little tiny mosquito can bother the hell out of you while you've never been bitten by an elephant who might be 10 times your size, 100 times your size. So small things can matter depending on what they are and how they are used and how effectively they're used. So that's what we're talking about here today. Little things do add up. Point number one, everybody notices, well, people who are serious about what they're doing when they are soft pancake, what's going on? They notice the little things. They notice the details. I'll tell you an example, I'll give you an example. When I was in college to get my, my business degree from Penn State University, we had to take an internship. You had to do some kind of internship at any kind of company just to, just to say that you did it. This is just part of the degree requirements. They probably still have this. And at the end of your internship, you had to do a, like give a presentation, like this hour long presentation about your internship what you did, who was the company that you interned for, what you learned, and how it was going to help you in your you know, professional career moving forward. And, I did, and most people do their internships their senior year. And the internship is like nine credits. So a normal class in college is like three credits. The internship itself is nine credits. So it's basically like you're working a full-time job, and you're probably not even getting paid, but you work there as an intern. So while we were in the midst of our internship, our uh, internship coordinator, this teacher, her name was Mrs. Wood, she made us do this uh, mock interview where her and this other guy who was like a I don't know, local business guy, they sat in the room and they would schedule times for every one of us students who was about to do an internship. We had to go there and we had to basically show up for what was supposed to be a job interview. And we had to get dressed up and everything for this, shake their hands. They would ask us questions. We had to answer their questions. We had to come with our own questions. We basically had to, we were being great. It was like a test. It was basically like a live test to go through this job interview. And one of the things that Mrs. Wood told us about before we did our mock interviews was what she called the rules of 12. Now, I never heard this before, but it was really good stuff. The rules of 12 means what she said was people notice three things. Number one, the top, the 12 inches from the top of your head down to, let's just say, like your collarbone, the 12 inches. So that means your hair, uh, your face. Is your face clean? Do you got too much makeup on for the, the ladies? Uh, what kind of glasses you got on? Uh, do you like uh, you brushed your hair and groomed yourself that day? Did you shave Did those 12 inches from the top? Then the 12 inches from the bottom of your feet up to the cuff of your pants. So are your shoes clean? You know, do you have toilet paper on the bottom of your, of your shoes? Are your cuffs clean? You no, know, you got on matching socks with your, your shoes, whatever you got on. So from the top, from the bottom, and then the first 12 seconds of the interaction. They notice that too. So how you walk into the room? Do you have a smile on your face? Are, are your teeth clean? You got, is food from lunch still stuck in your teeth? Uh, do you know how to shake hands? Are you pleasant? What is your energy like? Or do you smell good? Do you, have you practiced good hygiene? The first 12 from the top, 12 from the bottom, and the first 12 seconds. Those are all small details. And those details can make or break how another person feels about you. Any of you who's ever gotten a job interview or you ever been hired to do any type of consulting work or you ever just did any kind of business deal, the rules of 12 determined whether or not you got that deal. People make decisions quickly. Any of you ever read, there's an author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote a book called Blink. And the book is all about how us human beings make snap decisions. We make instinctive decisions based on small details that we pick up almost unconsciously about people. It's not some deep in-depth of three hour or 10 day analysis that we do about people before we make a decision about them. We make a decision about people quickly and then we come up with logical reasons that justify that decision. But the decision was made a long time ago. So any of you ever been in a relationship, any of you ever been on a date, any of you ever made a friend, any of you ever got a job interview, been on a job interview, been evaluated by another person, people make decisions about you within like Mrs. Wood told us in college, within 12 seconds, looking at how you groom yourself, how you present yourself, how you walk into a room, what your energy is like, they decide about you quickly. Those small details matter a lot. I read another story about how some uh, music bands, like let's say the, the Rolling Stones, I'm not saying it was them, but any music band, when they go out to perform a gig, they have what you call a trailer. And a trailer, I don't mean a trailer like the, the truck with the wheels. A trailer is a, or a rider is what they would call it, not a trailer, a rider. And a rider is just a list of all the demands that the group wants. So like Drake or Jay-Z, they have a rider that says, all right, in my dressing room, these are the things that I want. I want 12 bottles of Aquafina water and you need to be room temperature. Or I want um, a bag of Twizzlers. Or I want, uh, I want the room to be really hot. Or I want the room to be really cold. Or don't have anybody in my dressing room. 
they'll have this rider of all the things that they want, all these detailed things. And there was this one band, I don't remember which one, I've heard the story more than once, that this band would put on their rider every time they performed the show, they would tell the people ahead of time, we want a big bowl of peanut M&Ms, but we want all the brown M&Ms taken out of the bowl. So that meant somebody had to go buy all these M&Ms, pour them in a bowl, then they had to go through the bowl and take out all the brown M&Ms from the bowl. And what the band member said is that when we got to the venue, because their rider was long, it had all these things that they needed, right, to get ready for their show. And any of you have done any type of music, any type of live performance, production, you know there's a ton of details that go into that. You got the lighting, you got the microphones, you got the stage set up, there might be pyrotechnics, there might be a hundred people involved. You got all these different moving parts and all these different things. So the band, the reason that they put the M&M's thing in there is not because somebody hated brown M&M's. The reason they put it in there is because they wanted to make sure that whoever was in charge was paying attention to detail. So when they got there, the first thing they would look at is that bowl of M&M's and they would see, are there brown M&M's in the bowl? If there were not, then they would say, okay, somebody's paying attention to detail. But if there were, let's say they get there, they said no brown M&M's, but it's brown M&M's in the bowl. The band member said when that happened, they knew that they would have to double check everything on their list because somebody was not paying attention to detail. That was the one way that they knew this person wasn't really paying attention because they didn't get rid of all the brown M&Ms like we told them at the beginning. Any of you who's ever, again, you go for a job or any of you got a, your resumes on LinkedIn or something like that and you have misspellings on your resume, are you gonna get hired for a job? Is somebody gonna give you a job interview if you can't even spell your spell right on your own resume? What if you're selling something on the internet and you got a sales page up and you got misspellings on your sales page or you have gra grammatical, you have incorrect grammar on your own sales page on a product you're trying to sell for a few thousand dollars and somebody notices it. Are they going to buy from you? They might not. That might be the difference between them buying and not buying because they see, all right, if you can't even pay attention to the spelling on your own website, all right, what are you going to pay attention to when, I got, when you got my money already? So understand that these small details might be costing you opportunities and you don't even know it. So make sure you're paying attention to detail. Number two, topic here today is why you should sweat the small stuff. Number two, when everybody is good, the details make the difference. This is something somebody posted on Periscope earlier here today. It said Michael Jordan always paid attention to detail. Larry Brown, who's a basketball coach, I think he's coaching in college now. I think last I saw he was at uh, somewhere in Texas coaching D1 ball. But he coached in the NBA. He coached Allen Iverson. He coached a bunch of teams in the NBA. He coached the Indiana Pacers when they almost beat the Bulls. And one of the things that Larry Brown was famous for doing, when he would have training camp with the NBA team, he would make them, at the beginning of training camp, work on the proper footwork for running plays. I'm not talking about work on running the play, the footwork for running the play. So like, if you need to set a screen, you need to move your feet this way, you need to turn this way, you need to do things like this. These are the little details that Larry Brown, these are NBA players, these are the best players in the world. He's telling them how their footwork needs to be to run a play. Phil Jackson, who coached the Kobe, he coached Shaq, coached Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, everybody knows who Phil Jackson is. In training camp for his teams, Phil Jackson would teach his players how to throw a pass. They would work on throwing a chest pass. Here's the proper way to throw a pass. These are, imagine Phil Jackson walking up to Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan and saying, all right, today in practice, we're gonna work on how to throw a chest pass. And he would teach them, here's how you throw an entry pass, here's the way you throw an outlet pass, here's the way you throw a bounce pass. And he would go over that in detail every year in training camp. John Wooden who is a legendary coach of UCLA basketball. He won like, I forget how many championships he won. He won a whole lot of championships, the most of any college basketball coach ever. Do you know what John Wooden used to teach his players? If you went and played for UCLA, now mind you, they're the best team in the nation. Bill Walton, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, some of the best players of all time, especially in college, went to UCLA. When you first got to UCLA, Bill, being not Bill Walton, but uh, John Wooden would teach his players, check this out, he would teach them how to put on their socks and how to tie their sneakers. Now, mind you, we're talking about 17, 18 year old young men who are the best basketball players in the, in the nation. He's teaching them how to put on their socks and tie their sneakers. And the reason why he did that is because he understood that they put them on a certain way and tied their shoes a certain way. It would help them avoid getting blisters on their feet from playing so much basketball. These are the little tiny details. And these are some of the best coaches of all time. Phil Jackson, we know, won the most championships in the NBA. Uh, John Wooden won the most championships in college basketball. And these guys paid a ton of attention to detail. Nick Saban, who's the coach of Alabama football, I think they just won a big game last night. He's won a bunch of championships. 
He has a, a strong reputation for being pretty damn good at what he does, Nick Saban. Nick Saban once, I remember I was watching the game, and his team was up by like 50 points. The game was damn near over. But it was like the fourth quarter, and they're you know, basically riding out the clock. And one of his players made a mistake, like jumped off sides or a false start. While they're just running down the clock at the end of the game, the game was over. They were already winning by like 50 points. And Nick Saban ripped off his headset and screamed at this player as if the player had just cost them the championship. In a game that they were already up by 50 points. And I don't even know what he said, but you could see it. It was on, They showed it on the TV screen. I'm like, damn, this dude cares that much about the details of what's going on in the game that they're already winning by 50 points. I wonder what he's like in practice every day. I wonder what he's like dealing with these guys when the cameras are not on. And that kind of detail is the reason why these guys became that great. Not because of the big thing. Yes, they had... You know, you got the most talented players, you probably gonna have a pretty good team. But at the same time, you got to hone that talent and harness that talent and make sure it turns into something, something real, some actual real results. And that part of that was the detail that they paid attention to. Point number three, topic here today is why you should sweat the small stuff. I know there's a book that says don't sweat it. I'm telling you, you should sweat the small stuff in certain areas of detail in life. Number three, any of you who follows basketball, you remember the 2013 NBA Finals. If you don't remember what year that was, that was the year that the Miami Heat played against the San Antonio Spurs. And this is the year that the Heat won. Now, they played twice. The Heat won the first time, the Spurs won the second time. I'm talking about the first time when Miami beat San Antonio. And if you remember that series, in game six, the Spurs were up three games to two, and it looked like they were about to win the game. But then late in the game, LeBron James makes a three to make it close, and then he missed the three. Chris Bosh grabbed the rebound, and he passed it to this guy named Ray Allen. And Ray Allen caught the pass while he was moving backwards towards the corner at the three-point line and without even looking down at the ground, stepped back perfectly into the perfect spot to shoot a three-pointer, rose up and hit a three-pointer, not at the buzzer, but close to the buzzer, that sent the game into overtime and then the Heat win, won the game in overtime, then they won game seven, won the championship. And what a lot of people don't realize that Ray Allen, and he later on talked about this in some of his interviews and some of his teammates talked about this, Ray Allen actually practiced that shot the shot of he's inside the three-point line, backing up to catch the ball without looking and then rising up and making the three-pointer. He actually practiced that scenario. And why would you practice a scenario like that? When are you going to be running backwards to catch a ball at, in the corner for a three-point shot in the game? When is that ever going to happen, Ray Allen? When I used to make basketball videos every day, some of y'all remember that. Some of y'all have been around long enough to remember why I used to do this. People would sometimes ask me, Dre, when are you ever going to use that particular move in a game? I'll be doing some drill or some move. Like, when are you ever going to do that in a game? And I would always tell people, the point is not practice this move because when you get in the game, you're going to think about it and do it. That's not the reason you practice. You practice so that when you get in the game, you already have the skills ingrained in you instinctively. So when you need to do something, you do it without thinking about it. You don't practice because you're like, all right, in a game, I might need to do this. Ray Allen, there was never a time in all of Ray Allen's career, I'm not, I don't think, where he ever had to do that exact move that he did in that one game for the Miami Heat to keep them alive in the NBA Finals. But the one time that he needed it, that was the difference between them winning the championship and losing the championship because of the small detail that he paid attention to. Ray Allen even said that he would practice, check this out, he would practice laying on the ground. He would lay down on the ground like as if he was in a game that he fell down, get up, run to the three-point line, catch the ball, and shoot a three. He would practice that. Just for the, the one offhand chance that he got knocked down, he had to get up, run to the three-point line, and make a three really quick. Or sitting down on the ground. Like somebody knocking, he's sitting down like this. Get up, run to the three-point line, catch the ball, and make a three. He would work on these random scenarios because he didn't know when he would ever need them. And then the one time that he needed it, he made a legendary, iconic shot. Now he's a legend in, in Miami forever because of that shot that he made, because he paid attention to that detail. And he was a guy, I'll give you another detail about Ray Allen. In the NBA, when a team is on a road game, and I'm not talking about in the bubble, but in, in normal times, when it's a road game, there's an early bus and a late bus. So let's say the Miami Heat is playing against the, the New York Knicks. So the game is at 7.30. There's a bus that leaves the team hotel at let's like, say six o'clock. That's like the late bus to get over to the arena. And then there's another bus that leaves the hotel at maybe five o'clock. And that's the early bus. And the early bus is usually the players who don't play that much. They get on the early bus. And the rookies and the people who aren't really playing, they go over to the gym early and they do like a full workout before the game. And they use up a lot of energy in this workout. Now, why would they do this? It's because they know they're not gonna play. They, know they're not, they don't get a lot of playing time. So basically their workout before the game 
is their game because they know they're not going to play much in the regular game. So that's the early bus. And then usually the players who play all the time, the players who get a lot of playing time, they come over on a late bus because they're actually going to play in the game. They don't need to get a workout in before the game. Now, some players, of course, will get some early work in. Maybe they've been in a slump. Maybe they just want to work a little bit harder, whatever. They might get on the early bus. Here's what Ray Allen would do. Ray Allen would catch a cab before the early bus because the early bus wasn't early enough. He would catch a cab. He would pay his own money from the hotel to take a taxi to the gym, and he would be, get, be working out before the early bus even showed up just so he could get some extra work in before the game even started because he paid that much attention to detail. I heard Gilbert Arenas, who has his, who's a former NBA player, he has his own podcast. He told this story that one year his team, I don't know which year this was, he played for a couple different teams, but one year his team was about to play against the Lakers. And this is when the Lakers had Kobe. And before the game, Gilbert Arenas gets to the arena and he wants to get some extra work in. He gets there early, like, yeah, I'm going to get some extra work in because this is when he wasn't playing that much. I think this is when he was with Golden State Warriors. He didn't really play that much. He played a little bit, but not that much. So he gets to the arena early to get some extra work in because he wasn't playing. But when he gets to the arena to work out, who's in the arena already? It's Kobe. Now, Kobe's playing a lot at this point. Kobe's an all-star at this point. And Kobe, and he's watching Kobe work out. Kobe's working on the same move over and over and over and over and over again. He just keeps working on the same move over and over again. And later on, and then later on that night, when the Warriors, the team played against the Lakers, Kobe was doing that move. He kept doing that move, doing that move. He scored like 40 points against the Warriors that night. And Gilbert said later on in their careers when he got to know Kobe, he asked them, yo, why did you keep working on that, that same move? I saw you working on that same move over and over again. Why were you doing that? And Kobe said, because I wanted to master that move for every possible defense. I know that sometimes if I do it, the defense, defender might do this. Another time he might do this. And the next time he saw me do it already, he might do this. So I wanted to be ready for every possible way that somebody could defend that move I'm going to still do the move anyway. I'm going to just be ready for every possible way somebody could play defense against him. And Gilbert told that story as just a, a testament to how Kobe became so great. It's not because he was just super duper talented because everybody's talented at that level. It was the fact that he paid so much attention to detail that he was ready to deal with every possible defense of the move that he gave. Now, I use a couple of basketball examples here today, but these are everybody can understand these even if you don't play basketball that these people were paying attention to detail and you know who all these people are all right ray allen he won a championship even if you've never heard of him everybody knows who kobe is everybody knows phil jackson john wooden these people are legendary status in their professions again yes they were talented yes they had maybe good luck and good timing on their size but they pay attention to detail in ways that a lot of people don't talk about a lot of people don't tell you the detail of how Kobe would practice. Yes, was he talented? Could he jump high and all these things? Yes. And you hear these stories, he worked out this much and he only slept this many hours. What was he doing though? The little details make the difference. And this is something that I heard Tony Robbins say, that the difference between somebody being great, meaning like at the really highest level and being outstanding is not a skill difference. It is not a talent difference, it's a psychology difference. It's a difference in the mentality and the way that you decide I'm going to go to the highest possible level. And usually the difference between a person who's great and a person who is outstanding, meaning just a little bit better, is not a matter of a whole lot more work. It's just a matter of a mentality that says, I'm going to pay attention to the small details that will make me different from all these other people who are great. In basketball, for example, you got the all-star game. All-star game is like 24 people, the best 24 players in the world. But even amongst the all-stars, there's levels, right? There are people who are superstars and there are people who are just stars. What makes a superstar different? On some levels, it is talent, but on many other levels, what is it? It's the psychology that this person says, I'm gonna do just a little bit more. I'm gonna go a little bit further. I'm gonna work a little bit harder. This is the LeBron James's. This is the Kobe Bryant. This is the Michael Jordan. The people who decide to just do a little bit more than everybody else is doing, and that's how they get to the level that they're at. Tom Brady. I remember I was watching this documentary on, I think it was Facebook, Tom versus Time. And it was like two years, two, three years ago, and it was just a docu-series about Tom Brady and his life. And this is right after they had won the Super Bowl, right? And Tom Brady has won, like, what, five, six Super Bowls, something like that? They had just won the Super Bowl. Tom Brady's, like, 40 years old. And in the offseason, this dude flew from New England. This is Tom Brady himself. He flew from New England, where he lives, to California to go work out with some quarterback guru coach. And this quarterback guru coach is helping Tom Brady. He's coaching Tom Brady on his throwing technique in the offseason. Now, mind you, this dude is arguably one of the greatest football players of all time. He just won the Super Bowl, 
and he paid a coach and then flew across the country just to work with this dude so this coach could give him just a little bit of training to help him get maybe 1% better. I mean, how much better could Tom Brady get? You just won the Super Bowl. You're getting paid the most. You are arguably the greatest player of all time, but you're still hiring coaches and getting coached in the offseason just so you can get 1% better. Even the trainer said this on camera. He was like, look, Tom Brady's already the best player in the game, but I'm coaching. He's paying me to coach him because he just wants to get that 1% edge that will make him just a little bit better. Who's even going to notice that that little bit that he added? Nobody. But he did it anyway. Why? Attention to detail. All that being said, I'm going to recap my points in a moment. If you got a question about anything that I just said, go ahead and post it in the comment section right now. I'm going to tell you how you can get this book right here free. I should have told you this at the beginning. I'm going to tell you how you can get this book here free. I'm going to recap my points. And if you have a question, go ahead and post it. This book right here is called The Mirror of Motivation. The subtitle is The Self-Guide to Self-Discipline. You can get this book, the physical book, mailed to your doorstep for free by going to mirrorofmotivation.com. Now let me tell you why you want the book. I already told you the title. I told you how to get it. The reason why you want this book is because everybody who's listening to me, you have goals. You have things you wish to achieve in life. Otherwise, you would not be listening to me. Secondly, since I got a hat on that says work on your game, I'm assuming you're willing to do some work. Okay, are you willing to do work? I think everybody listening to me is willing to work. Okay, you're willing to put the effort in. The challenge is, you, even though you have goals and you're willing to work, challenge is you might not be getting close to it yet because you have not asked yourself the key question. Let me tell you the key question. Who do I need to be? Not what do I want to have? Not what do I need to do? You already answered those questions. Here's the question you need to answer. Who do I need to be? What kind of energy do I need to have every day? How do I want people to feel when they meet me? What do I want people to say about me when I walk out of the room? What kind of energy? How do I want to change the energy of a room when I come into it? What do I want to see in myself when I look at myself in the mirror? This book right here, The Mirror of Motivation, will provide you the frameworks for you to answer that question, those questions, for yourself and apply them to your life on a day-to-day -day basis. I won't always be around to answer your questions. You can't always look up some inspirational YouTube video, but you can always look in the mirror at yourself, look within. That's why this book is called The Mirror of Motivation. It is not Dre hyping you up motivation. It is not some inspirational speech motivation. It is the mirror of motivation so you can get it from yourself because you will always be around no matter where you go, there you are. You can get the book free. All you do is cover a small shipping charge by going to mirrorofmotivation.com. Just the same as the title, take out the, the mirrorofmotivation.com. The book is paid for. All you do is cover the shipping. All that being said, Again, the topic here today is why you should sweat the small stuff. Number one, people notice the details to see how serious you are, like the rules of 12 I told you about in my college uh, mock interview. Number two, when everybody is good, the details make the difference between winning and losing. John Wooden used to teach his players how to put on their socks and how to tie their sneakers. These are 18-year-old kids. He's teaching them how to put on socks and tie sneakers because of the details. And number three, Ray Allen, he would practice backpedaling into a three-point shot because he knew there might be one time in his 20-year career that he might need to do that. And the one time he needed to do it, he was ready. And he helped his team win the championship because of it. Paying attention to detail is the difference between being great and being amazing and being legendary. All that being said, if you got a question, go ahead and post it in the comments section. I will answer them right now. Andrew said, didn't know that about John Wooden. We'll look for any video on YouTube. Andrew, what I would suggest you do is read John Wooden's book. I think that's where I heard that. Andrew, uh, look up John Wooden's book. He has, a, I think he has more than one book. And there's a couple books that other people wrote uh, with him that uh, about John Wooden. I think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote one about John Wooden. I think Bill Walton might have written one. I'm not, don't hold me to that. And I know John Wooden wrote his own book. So look up the books. The best details, ladies and gentlemen, for everybody, Andrew and everybody else, the best details are in books, not in YouTube videos. <laughs> Shout out to YouTube. But if y'all want the real details, the, the real, the best stories, read books. YouTube ain't got them. All right. All that being said, I'm seeing if we got any questions in the comments section. Uh, who Rowdy is in the house. What's going on? And Cash said, if I burn the bridge with the coach who offered me a spot, but I thought I was too good for it. Now I need that opportunity. What should I do? I told him my value was offered him higher than what he offered. All right, so you should go back to him and tell him that you realize that you were wrong. This is a good way to mend the bridge with anybody is to let them know that you were wrong. All right, nobody will be mad at you for admitting that you were wrong. All right, 
Now, if you don't want to admit that you were wrong, then people can still be mad at you. So cash Chris, go to that coach and say, coach, you know what? I was wrong. My value was not as high as I thought it was. Can I still get that opportunity? Simple as that. Hoop Loudy says, what are small details we should use as metrics when growing a business to help student athletes? But you got to decide your KPIs, uh, Hoop Loudy. KPIs are key performance indicators. You had to decide what are those for you. Every business is different. So a basketball player, one player might, his KPI might be rebounds. Another player, it might be uh, how many points he scores. Another player might be uh, paying, working hard in practice because he doesn't play that much. So it really depends. You have to decide uh, which ones matter the most for you in your particular situation. All right, again, so everybody, mirrorofmotivation.com. The book is already paid for. All you do is cover the shipping, small shipping charge. Again, mirrorofmotivation.com. No brown m with Van Halen. Right, so there it is. Somebody looked that up. So thank you, uh, mrose974, for checking on that. Making sure that you are paying attention to the details. Everybody, if you like what you just heard, understand I do these mostly off the top, but... I do a daily masterclass that is called Work On Your Game. You can find it in any podcasting app. It is an Apple podcast, Spotify, SoundCloud, whatever. Just look up my name, Dre Baldwin, or just look up the word, the phrase, Work On Your Game. is in there. It's very easy to find. It's every single day. Yes, you heard me every day. We have over 1,600 episodes in there. So if you like what you just heard and you want to learn from somebody like me, I'm going to give you some real, objective, logical uh, things to help you develop yourself and develop your game and take your business, your sport, your life to the next level, whatever your next level happens to be, go find that show, subscribe to it, listen to it every single day. There is nothing out there. There is nobody who does what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and when it comes to the audio experience. There is nobody. There's not a single person you can name that comes even close to what I'm doing. So anyway, all that being said, look that up. It's called Work On Your Game. Go to mirrorofmotivation.com. Get this book. You don't have it already. Uh, Cash said, or as a hooper, should I condition year round? It depends. Are you a, are you a hooper year round or are you only a hooper in certain parts of the year? And Sale said, you're right, Dre, about talent. I've seen rankings and players competing in scrimmage. Their athleticism and size are huge. Yes, that is very true. So everybody, mirrormotivation.com. I'll be doing another live tomorrow. Don't know the topics. Just stay tuned. Work on your game. We out of here. Dre all day.